A week or so ago, I had this dream that uh, woke me up in the middle of the night. Now, uh, I am not one who has a lot of vivid dreams. In fact, uh, I'm often jealous of those people who can remember their dreams and uh, gain some kind of meaning from them uh, and always impressed how they could remember their dreams over and over. But this dream uh, woke me up in the middle of the night. And the dream was, I was at the mall, and there were all these people around, and not a single person was wearing a mask. And that's all the dream was. Not sure how to interpret that, but what I do know is that very simple, mundane thing of being at the mall with bumping into people no one wearing a mask, that I woke up with this sense of dread. A sense of fear and anxiety. In fact, it wasn't just a dream. Being at the mall with lots of people, no one wearing a mask, was a nightmare. And what struck me as I reflected on that is that those things that are the most mundane, normal, routine things, going to the grocery store, uh, getting a haircut, um, uh, simple mundane things are now filled with fear and anxiety. And so I find myself at a loss. It feels like I've lost something very profound, the simple and the mundane. And so, I grieve. As the numbers are reported uh, each and every day of the number of cases and deaths globally, over 300,000 in our, our, our country alone, climbing past 88,000, uh, CDC projects 130,000 by August. And I am blown away at the amount of death. The images we see of people in ventilators and hospitals, and I grieve. We all grieve. When you hear of someone who's lost a job or how many Millions of jobs. It's almost overwhelming. We can't keep track. It's such a huge number. It's almost unreal. And we grieve. Or reports of hundreds, if not thousands of people having to go to a food pantry to get food that so many people may go hungry. And I feel overwhelmed, and I grieve. And then uh, I hear of, of uh, those seniors graduating from high school who can't have those normal things that make up, um, uh, you know, such a joyous, momentous occasion for the normal, routine things that which families gather together and celebrate and. I grieve for them that that's been taken away. And I know they grieve and feel sorrow. And then I know of grandparents yearning to, to hug their grandkids, haven't been able to touch their grandkids for months. And there's sorrow and grief with that. And I think we don't realize this probably that much, but our own kids are feeling great sorrow. Baseball, I mean, not to be able to even just do normal things, to hang out with their friends and, and to, to play baseball in the summer. Things we would normally take for granted and mundane has been ripped from them. And I think everyone is so filled with grief and sorrow.
In fact, I've often been struck that I think much of the conflict and anger uh, that we see is, is we're trying to wrestle with opening things back up again or uh, request to wear, wear uh, masks. And in fact, I think often what is happening here is this unresolved grief that lives on in ourselves and in our communities. That really, this desire to go back to normal is to kind of say, okay, I'm, I want to get over this. I want to go on with my life. I don't, I don't necessarily want to acknowledge what has been taken from me. And I just want to get on with living. And the problem with that, the challenge of that, is the truth is you can't ignore grief. You can't simply run away from it. I guess you can. But it always haunts you. The challenge is, uh, even as we desire to want to get on with our lives and, and leave behind um, what has happened to us and the struggles we've experienced, without acknowledging them, without, and I think this is important, without really getting to share them with each other, it hurts our soul. And so I think I understand that, it's, that the protests are less about getting your hair cut or uh, getting your nails done at the salon. They're really about unresolved and unacknowledged grief. And unfortunately, our leadership is not able to help us acknowledge and share our grief. And that hurts our souls. Makes us angry and fearful. You know, if you think about it, tragedies that happen, disasters that happen, we usually have an opportunity to acknowledge our grief and to share that grief. I know after 9-11, so many people came to church because they needed to acknowledge this pain that they felt, this sense of fear, the sense in which the world has changed, and they needed to come together to acknowledge and share their grief. I know sometimes when you're driving down the road, on occasion you'll see a cross uh, marking a spot, and, and what that means usually is someone tragically has died there, and it seems somehow important to us that the way through sorrow and grief is to acknowledge it. And in posting that cross there to, to share it with others, however anonymously. And in fact, that's part of the insidiousness of this COVID-19 is that we really, the normal ways in which we would be able to grieve, we come together to do that, to acknowledge it in each other and to share it together because that's the only way not around grief or over it, but through grief. Is to walk hand in hand together. And we've just not had an opportunity to do that. Now I talked about Psalms last week, how they are the prayer book of the church. Uh, and how psalms are a unique part of the Bible because they are human utterances. Uh, as I shared last week, uh, more often than not, the, the Bible is filled with God speaking to us through the prophets or, or through stories about the history of ancient Israel, through the Gospels uh, about Jesus. God is speaking to us. The psalms, uh, which permeate all parts of the Bible, are our words to God, these human words reaching out to God, and one of the things that if you read the Psalms all the way through, you would discover 70 some odd Psalms that would be called Psalms of Lament. Psalms of Grief. Psalms acknowledging and sharing 
sorrow and grief. The psalm we read this morning is such a human prayer. Oh God, don't rebuke me. Oh God, do not ignore me. I am in pain. He puts it, my bones are shaking with terror. Sounds a little melodramatic, right? <laughs> but I, I, part of the reason I chose this psalm is there's this beautiful line in verse 6, I'm weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. Again, a little melodramatic, but it expresses the depth of human sorrow. In fact, the Hebrew could be translated, my tears melt my mattress. And here in our prayer book are these psalms over and over again which cry out to God and say, I'm in pain and I grieve, and I lament. I'm reminded the last words of Jesus on the cross, which is a lamentation. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And those, those words come from a song. But the power of the Psalms of Lamentations isn't simply, it isn't simply that just acknowledging grief, it's sharing it with God. And it always moves from a point in which, of this great grief, it moves throughout that Psalm. Every Psalm of Lamentation ends, in a sense, with these words, I am heard. And there's healing in that. In fact, the best gift you can give to anyone filled with grief and sorrow, the best gift we can give to each other, is not trying to take away their grief and their weeping and sorrow, but to share it. To say, I hear it. And that's the only way through sorrow is to acknowledge and share it. And as the psalm ends, the Lord has heard my weeping. So one of the things that occurs to me, maybe one of the things that we need to do uh, as people of faith, one of the things that one of the challenges we can give ourselves is in this COVID-19 world in which we'd normally gather in a sanctuary to, to acknowledge our grief and to share it together, we're going to have to find different ways to express it. Especially if we don't have the leadership in the communities to guide us with that, to acknowledge it and and to share it with each other. Maybe what we do is do things at home. Maybe we light a candle. And we share with each other, with our, our loved ones. We share the grief we feel, what we miss, what we're afraid of. You know, I remember after 9-11, in, in, in fact, after the Oklahoma City bombing, that there were fences that had pictures put in it and flowers and some kind of acknowledgement, some kind of public demonstration of grief. Maybe we, we create a space, an altar of sorrow space in which we might bring some things that remind us or acknowledge this is what we miss. A picture of, uh, for our kids of grandma and grandpa or of the grandmother and grandpa sharing a picture of their kids. I think one of the things, one of the best things we can do for our kids is acknowledge the grief they feel, and it's all right. The normal lives they've lived have been taken from them. It is a kind of trauma. 
And if we can help our kids and help each other acknowledge that grief, and if we can share it with each other, the Lord will hear our weeping. And we will be filled with hope and possibility. Amen.